What is up? What is up? What is up, everybody? First, I want to thank you so much for joining us for our Thursday online service. This is our Try Me series, and I know that it is absolutely going to bless your life. I don't know if you're going to like me after tonight. I really don't, especially my sisters. But if you can hold on for part four on Sunday night at 6 p.m., we're dealing with brothers. So if you could just get through tonight, I believe your life will be blessed, challenged, convicted, and encouraged, all for the purpose of being all that God has called us to be. I'm thankful that you're here with us on tonight. Let's get straight to the word. Once again, thank you everybody for joining us on tonight and listen, we have a word for you and I want to skip all the preliminaries, all the platitudes, all the introductory declarations and let's just get to work. So if you would, could you follow along with me on 1 Samuel chapter 25, we're going to read a few passages of scripture. This possibly is a story that you don't know about. 1 Samuel chapter 25 uh, roughly verses 32 through 35, a backdrop of this. David and his boys have heard about Nabal having some food. So what do men like to do? We like to eat. So David's like, listen, I've helped Nabal and his boys. We gonna go over there to eat and uh, Nabal disrespect David. And so David was one of those soldiers. I don't play with disrespect. I'm gonna ride on them. I'm gonna let them feel my wrath. But his wife Abigail comes out and has a conversation with David, and this is where we're gonna part for the time that we have together on tonight. First Samuel chapter 25, verses 32 to 35. Then David said to Abigail, "Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed is your advice, and blessed are you." because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you have hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light, David was not playing, surely by morning light, no males would have been left to Nabal. <laughs> so, David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respect your person. Our clause of concern and our verse of emphasis takes residence in verse 33. And blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and avenging myself with my own hand. Father, I thank you that you bless this hour. Anoint my lips to be the soundtrack of heaven in Jesus' name. And everybody who agrees with that prayer in the room in all caps, I need you to say amen. Amen. Oh, man. Hold on, wait a minute. Part three has some heat in it. This is now the third installment of our Try Me series. And if I'll be honest, I don't think you're going to like me after this one, especially the ladies. I think brothers, they're going to be feeling me for certain parts. But ladies, you may not like me, so buckle your seatbelts. But I feel as though I'm a well-rounded kingdom spokesman. So on part three, ladies, it's kind of coming for you. But then on part four on Sunday night, then it's coming for the brothers. So if you could just hang on for part three and get to part four, I believe it's going to bless your life, all right? And I'm explaining about that a little bit later. Um, this is now our second week in this Try Me series. We are in lesson number three of our Try Me series. For part one of this series, we dealt with trust issues, a message that was orbiting around try trust. Try trusting God because faith in God also requires faith in his timing. 
And do you trust God enough to where when you've been working hard for something and believing for God to give you Rachel, when he gives you Leah, Leah is his will, but Rachel is your will. And have you got to a place where I trust God so much, I just want your will. You get this posture, this nevertheless posture. That's what Simon said to the Lord. He said, Lord, we've been out here all night. Fishing is what we do. Being a rabbi is what you do. They ain't biting tonight. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. God is looking for nevertheless obedience. He's looking for nevertheless holiness. He's looking for nevertheless prayer because it's our nevertheless nature that positions us to receive an abundant catch. Somebody say trust issues. And then for part two, we came together and we dealt with can you please hurry up? This message was all about try patience. We've tried doubt. We tried worry. But why don't you try patience? Because Jesus said it this way. All men will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. And our foundational text last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4, Paul was telling us that love is patient. So if we merge these two passages together, what Jesus is really saying is by this, all men will know that you are my disciples by the way you are patient with one another. And what is patience? Patience is the ability to survive the not yet. Patience is the ability to survive the not yet. Have they start putting the lid back on the toothpaste? Not yet. Has your teenager start making up their bed like you asked them to? Not yet. Has God answered that prayer? Not yet. Is there any evidence that the prayer that you have prayed is about to come into fruition? Not yet. Have they start listening? Not yet. Have they got over that insecurity? Not yet. Have they got over that doubt? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. It's the not yet that reveals our patient meter. And since he told us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, and in the root word of disciples, we see disciplined. Jesus was saying, go make disciplined people, and if you're going to make disciplined people, you're going to have to have some patience. You're going to have to have some patience. And then I got on my soapbox for a second. I said, listen, if God was patient with us during our rebellion... Surely we could be patient with him during our becoming. And I put my foot on the gas and I said, I'm going to go deeper. If God was patient with us during our rebellion, surely we could be patient with others as they're becoming. Because there's a problem when you want to receive grace, but you don't want to extend grace. And I believe both messages have been amazing. And I don't know about you, but has the word of God ever came off like a wrecking ball? (laughs) <laughs> like you listen to a message you're like man I feel wrecked that message just wrecked me it's like a wrecking ball and as I was thinking about it I believe God literally wants us to be his construction sites literally wants us to be his construction sites there's some stuff he has to knock down and tear down because there's some stuff that he has to build up I can not build on the rubble of your will I have to tear that down and I have to build the skyscraper of my real my will because there's something that I want to do in your life and many times it feels like a wrecking ball many times you hear messages where you feel wrecked and there's two things that I would like to reiterate before we go to the new content on tonight we stated in part one that we have to be able to have the ability to discern the season and I believe for many of us the season that we're in is when we should have a caution yellow tape around our heart and our vibes and a big sign that says, closed, I'm under construction. (laughs) Closed, I'm under construction. Because anybody who comes on this site prematurely, they could possibly experience injury, bodily harm, or even death. There's some stuff that's broken. Listen, there's some stuff that God's trying to heal me. There's some stuff. I have some leaks, but I'm thankful that when Jesus was here, he was not just a rabbi, but his earthly occupation was carpentry. This means he specialized in building, repairing, and fixing stuff that's broke. So I'm in a season right now, Jesus fix me. I'm in a season, God, right now, fix my perspective. God, fix my worry, fix my doubt, fix my mind, oh God, where I can stop overthinking and creating scenarios that aren't true and being counseled by my thoughts. And I'm not sleeping, sleeping, and I don't have peace. I'm under construction. I'm closed. Can I get somebody to put that in the room? I'm closed. (laughs) I'm under construction. 
And the second thing I would like to touch, somebody asked, like, listen, I understand you're talking about ponds, partners, parasites, and projects. I get that. But I just got a question, Jerry. Why do I keep on attracting parasites? <laughs> like, what's wrong with me? Why do I keep on attracting parasites? I want to attract a partner, but I keep on colliding with these parasites. What's wrong with me? And if I could change your perspective, I think the question is not what's wrong with me, but the proper question is what's in me. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. What's in me that terrifies hell so much that he has to keep on trying to send me distraction after distraction after headache after headache because thieves do not target empty houses. Please hear me. Thieves do not target empty houses. There's something on the inside of you that hell fears. There's something on the inside of you that God put for your life. And the devil knows it because parasites look for life. They don't look to feed on dead things. When I go fishing, if I use dead shrimp, I'm going to attract bottom feeders. I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to attract catfish. That's a word in itself. I'm going to keep on attracting catfish, but if I want to catch something bigger, if I want to catch a drum, if I want to catch a redfish, I got to use live bait. So the devil knows, like, listen, it's not necessarily you. It's what's in you. Please hear me. You are not responsible for what you attract, but you are responsible for what you entertain. Did you hear what I just said? You may not be responsible for what you attract, but you are responsible for what you entertain. He's after what's in you because you literally give them life. <laughs> He's after what's in you. I shared this before. Have you ever noticed that the devil is referred to as that old serpent? And the type of snake is a python. The way pythons kill is they have a stronghold. They wrap themselves around you and have a stronghold. And every time you breathe, they squeeze. Every time you breathe, they squeeze. The, the evidence for them to get tighter is when you breathe. God said, let there be light. There's light. He said, let there be firmness and vegetation. There's firmness and vegetation. But when it came to you and I, he breathed the breath of life on the inside of us. He ruach. <sighs> He breathed the breath of life on the inside of us. And what is that serpent after? The breath. He's after that God-given nature, that God-given gift, that anointing, that power, that next level you. Because he never wants you to transition in becoming everything that God has you to be. It's not what's wrong with me, but rather what's in me. So we dealt with trust issues. We talked about try trust. We dealt with, can you please hurry up? We were dealing with, try patience. But on tonight, I would like to speak from this topic around this thought for a few moments, the language of a queen. <clears throat> the language of a queen. How about instead of talking venomous, let's try to talk virtuous. How about let's learn how to have a kingdom language. Are y'all ready for this? Are y'all ready for this? Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and everybody under the sound of my voice watching online, this scripture might be education to some, but then a reminder to others. And depending on where you are in your faith journey, you possibly heard it before, memorized it, highlighted it, or even could have posted it on your social media as a status or a caption. And this statement takes residence and derives in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, where the Bible tells us death and life are in the power of the tongue. So in other words, your mouth is either a grim reaper or a king activator. My God, your mouth is either a grim reaper or a king activator. It's either a serial killer or a delivery unit. It gives life. The way you speak and the language that comes out of your mouth gives birth to something. The way that you speak and the language that comes out of your mouth can cause for a baby to leap on the inside of a dreamer. The way that you speak and the language that comes out of your mouth can convince a strong man who has fallen on his knees to get back up. 
And I can't speak for anybody else, but I personally personally need a voice in my life that does not strengthen my Simon. I need a voice that strengthens my Peter. I don't need a voice in my life that strengthens my Jacob. I need a voice that strengthens my Israel. I don't need a voice in my life that strengthens my old self. I need a voice in my life that strengthens who I'm supposed to be and who I'm called to be and that will remind me who I am. There is a language, and I want to know, Do you understand that on the inside of every man, there is a king and a fool? Let me break it down. There was a king and a fool. And I think two questions that we need to ask ourselves on tonight. The first question is, do you know which one to talk to? And the second question is, do you know how to talk to his king? Now, this isn't just romantic. This is period. Period. I am an equal sex offender. In certain parts of this message, the brother's going to be like, yeah, this is Sparta, yeah. And in other parts of this message, lady's going to be like, see, that's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Where they at, though? Where they at, though? Let me know where they at. Sometimes we don't understand that there is a language. There is a language that speaks to a king. Your boss, your father, your brother your grandfather, or even your son, there's a king on the inside of him. And do you know how to speak to that king on the inside of him? Because how God has wired us, men, we're warriors. We're fighters. We're kings. We're chiefs. But life has a way of hitting us so hard that it can make even the strongest man to fall to his knees. Sidebar. A man is always stronger when he's on his knees because the man who can kneel before God can stand before anyone. But sometimes we don't talk about it enough. But brothers, we have doubts and we can be on the canvas of life, not secure about who we are. Don't know if I'm going to be a good father. Don't know if I'm going to be a good leader. And we hear the ref of life counting four, five, six Seven, and there has to be somebody in this man's life who is louder than the referee. Somebody who can convince him to get off the ground because you still have some fight left. Your community needs you. The church needs you. The government needs you. The community needs you. Your family needs you. Your son needs you. Your daughter needs you. Your wife needs you. You have a critical position to play in the earth. And there must be somebody's voice who is louder in that man's life. One day, I was sparring. And this guy was getting on my nerves because every time I was swinging to punch him, he was smiling at me because I was missing. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to knock old buddy's head off, right? And I'm getting all discouraged, and I hear my coach yelling so loud that I really can't even hear the dude talking noise. My coach is yelling so loud, flowers, go to the body, then go up top. But I want to knock his head off, right? You ever been in a season where you don't even want to do the right thing, you just want to do what you want to do? You just want to prove a point. You just want to prove that I am worth something. You just want to prove I can do it. I didn't want to listen to him, but he kept on saying, flowers, go to the body, then go up top. And then I just decided to listen to my coach, and I went to the body and went up top. Boom, I hit him right in the middle of the fight. I was like, oh, snap. And coach was like, put your hands up, put your hands up. (laughs) I got so distracted. But what if I didn't have somebody in my life, please hear me, What if I didn't have a language in my life to encourage me? You're fighting wrong. It doesn't mean that you're not a good fighter. It just means I can see the technique of your enemy. I can see the the technique of your adversary that's trying to knock you out. But if you listen and if you have a voice in your corner that can speak a language that can get you to adjust the warfare that you're in. Because right now you're in a level of warfare where I need some wisdom. I need a language. In my corner. And the untold truth about men is there is a language that activates our king. So possibly one of the problems, I'm not saying it's the main problem, but one of the problems, could it be we never received the language? We never received the language. I never was taught how to roar. I never was taught what manhood looked like. I never was taught what biblical manhood looked like. 
And for the most of us, many times our father wasn't there and mother's trying to do the best that she can. And I haven't seen men roar. And this is the problem. When we don't hear enough roaring men because there appears to be a famine of kingdom men. Can we talk about it? There appears to be a, fa a famine of godly men. And if we don't hear enough men who have a roar, we'll get impressed with the man who has a meow. Impressed with a man who has a meow. And mama trying to do the best that she can, but she really can't speak to the king in him. Because she can't help but to speak from the wound in her. And so by default, what she has done is she has nurtured and has raised a wounded man. Did you hear what I just said? Listen, when God created Adam and Eve, he put Adam to sleep, opened Adam's side, took out a rib, and closed it. And many times when we hear that scripture, we just overlook the surgery part. I think the fact that God closed up Adam's side was very intentional because if God would not have closed it, it could have performed, it could have made an actual infection. And I think, brothers, we have to be honest enough to say, there's some stuff that I need God to close. There's some wounds that I need God to fix. There's some areas in my life that hurts, and I need God to deal with them because watch this. If I never allow God to heal these wounds, a woman can never be my wife. She'll always be my nurse. Did you hear what I just said? She'll never be my wife. She'll only be my nurse. Have you ever been in a relationship where you're trying to nurse his ego? You're trying to nurse his childhood trauma? You're trying to nurse his esteem issues? You're trying to nurse his emotional issues? It's because I never was taught the language. I never was taught the language. If daddy was there, because it's possible many times that daddy was there, but he wasn't there, he didn't teach me the language. So I don't know how to rule from a palace and I have formulated my preference in the pasture because when you don't know who you are your very preference could be making you settle preach Holy Ghost I'm gonna give you Bible I'm gonna give you Bible somebody say Bible I'm gonna give you Bible David was anointed as king over Israel in the pasture right Samuel anoints him and leaves him in the pasture then goes to Ramah so what do we have David has a pasture placement with a palace anointing and so when you recognize that you have oil for the palace you don't date pasture you don't date pasture liking people at this level is beneath you because I'm not staying here can I just say it how I want to say it some of us have too much oil for some people I'm not staying in this pasture I'm just staying here for a season there's some stuff God's trying to teach me I have to learn how to use my slingshot I'm gonna fight some lions tigers and bears oh my I'm not gonna be staying here so I'm not formulating things that I like here because I'm going to the next level listen a bird and a fish can fall in love but where they gonna live <laughs> a bird and a fish can fall in love but where they gonna live and some of us may think it's comedic but we have been drowning to stay with some fish preach Holy Ghost we need to talk about this because there are tons of conferences all talking about a woman's brokenness and women how they're hurting but men are wounded too Men are broken too and we try to hide it by some sense of false macho masculinity and we don't want to cry because when we were six years old somebody told us that's for girls and we don't know how to express ourselves and we don't know how to vent healthily and we don't know how to talk. We have to deal with this issue because maybe there's a language that we need that can cause us to be who God has called us to be. Listen, this is not just confined to the sacred. This, is all, this also works for the secular because Delilah knows how to use the language. Mm. Yeah, that Delilah secretary, she knows how to use that language. That Delilah woman that he saw at the gym, she knows how to use the language. The only problem is usually men can't discern she may look good and she may be good to me, but she's not good for me. That girl is poison. She may look good. But she's not good for me. And a lot of times, brothers, we get deceived because oh, I'm about to get in trouble. I'm about to get in trouble. A lot of times guys get deceived and we settle for stuff that's toxic and we stay into something bad because she gives you good orgasms. Is this too much? I'm sorry. I just believe my generation requires real. <laughs> we require real talk. The church needs to talk about this. 
We need to talk about this because if we don't talk about it in here, we're going to go out in the world and try to get educated. And then parents are going to wonder what's wrong with my children. What's wrong with them? Why are they acting like this? We cannot keep, we cannot keep sending our children to Caesar and then act confused when they come back talking like Romans. We have to be able to talk about stuff like this in church. There's a language. There is a language. And I just like, man, why, why every time we talk about counterfeits, it's always ascribed to that being men. Like, yeah, these dudes are trifling. I'm like, sisters can be trifling too. Sisters can be trifling, good for nothing type of sister. They could be out there too. They don't care if your husband's married. As a matter of fact, the fact that he is married makes him a target. There are women who are like this too. Why do we always think it's men? Like, how come we can't talk about brothers having standards? So what, you can have a standard that he can't call you after a certain time, but then it's okay for him to pay your rent? That's a double standard. That's a husband privilege. Bro, why are you paying her rent, bro, bro? She is not your wife. Okay, y'all don't want to talk. I told you, sometimes women going to be saying amen, and other times brothers going to be saying amen. So now listen, I think sometimes the church spends so much time talking about Jezebel that we don't spend enough time talking about Abigail. I didn't make that rhyme, the Bible did. We spend so much time talking about Jezebel, but not enough time talking about Abigail. Abigail knew the language. Abigail knew the language. Please hear me. Listen. Abigail knew the language so much so where she was able to talk to David and remind him who he is. He was so angry due to him being offended that he forgot who he is. And all I'm trying to ask you is, do you know the language that could help somebody be reminded on who they are? Bro, you are anointed. You got the oil. God has chosen you. You are a worshiper. You are a beast with the harp. You are a warrior. Why are you tripping over Nabal? God has a plan for your life. Can I mess this up for a second? A lot of people, they don't understand that wife is just the title but help meet is the function I should just end the sermon right here listen wife is the title when you ask God when you say okay God um, I thank you for my marriage but I need you to do something with this joker are you praying say God could you please send me somebody what you are really doing is saying God send me somebody to help changes everything. God, I believe I'm a woman who has the grace to help him evolve in his manhood. Now, I'm not talking about raising him. We already talked about that. Projects, pause. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about a kingdom sold out man still needs help. He still needs help. And if this is what you're desiring, you're saying, God, I want to be a helper. There's some places that I know he can't meet without my help. So give me the wisdom and give me the virtue and give me the purity and give me the character and give me the righteousness righteousness, and give me the prayer life and give me the holiness to be able to help upgrade this brother's life. <sighs> okay. All right. So now look, if that's what you desire, then at the same time as brothers, we have to be men who listen. Maybe she's not nagging, she's activating. Uh, we we got to talk about it because the Bible has a lot to say about the mouth. I was talking to my wife about this. I was like, man, you know, he, like, God was so intentional. He was letting us know it is better for you to be in the desert, brother. <laughs> it is better for you to be in the desert than for you to be in a house with a quarrelsome woman. Listen, this is the Bible. I'm just quoting the Bible. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> then it says, listen, brother, it is better for you to be on top of the roof than for you to be in the house with a quarrelsome wife. And I'm like, my God, you don't even consider the elements. <laughs> I'm like, what if, it's, what, if it's, what if it's winter? Guys, I listen, it's better for you to be out here getting frostbit. It's better for you to be out here freezing your hiney off than for you to be in the house with a woman that does not know how to control her mouth and loves to fight and loves to quarrel. This is the word of God, y'all. It's better for you to be burning up in this humidity on this roof with this towel burning your hind parts than for you to be inside with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> There's a language. 
Can I hear somebody say language? language? There's a language that activates our king. But men, we have to be men who listen. So therefore, this changes everything. This means, men, we should stop looking for big backsides and breasts and look for a woman who knows the language. Okay. I'm not saying God's going to give you somebody that startles you if they roll over too fast in the middle of the night. I'm not saying that God's going to give you somebody and say, listen, this is my will. Love them in spite. I'm not saying that God's going to do that. He knows you. God only knows all the hairs on your head. He's, he only knows your personality. He knows what you need. But it's possible for us to get so infected by culture that we don't even know what to look for. When you know who you are, you know what to look for. If you don't know who you are, you won't even know who to take with you. I have to know who I am so I can identify the language. And there's so many, listen, this is not weakness. It takes strength to understand this. It takes strength and meekness to understand this. A lot of us have personalities that aren't even you. You picked up a personality, like you're goofy, but your ex thought you were immature. And so you change yourself to cater to them, but God's person that he has for you or the place that God wants you to be in or the ministry that God needs you to lead, he needs that goofy you. But many times if we're not careful, we will become somebody, like adjust ourselves to becoming what they need and that's not who God needs for you to be. There's a language. This isn't weakness. This takes strength. Could it be you couldn't get your son to respond because you're not speaking to his king? Could it be you could not get your husband to respond because you're not speaking to, his, speaking to the king in him? Could it be your coworkers, you can't get them to respond because you're not speaking to the king in him? I'm coming for the brothers on Sunday. I know it's hot, but I'm trying to get us to understand. There's this language of virtue instead of this language of venom that God wants us to learn. Abigail knew the language. And this is what's so powerful about this. Abigail was married to Nabal. Nabal means fool. She was with a fool, but she didn't allow who she was with to cause her to speak foolish. All right, I'm going to give you Bible. 1 Samuel 25. Let's read, verse 20, let's read verse 25. Listen, it says, Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name. And folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. So she's like, listen, I understand that he's a fool, but I wasn't there. And I think it's powerful when you can recognize I'm dealing with a fool, but I don't have to embody it and cause me to speak foolish. That ex-relationship, that person that you were with that was with a fool, you were with the fool, do you now speak foolish because you were with a fool? I'm making my lip hang on purpose. He was a fool. She was a fool. And are you allowing their foolish self to cause you to engage and speak foolishly? Maybe that's the problem. A lot of brothers were around fools. We hang around fools. We've been taught foolish things like manhood is about how well you throw your fist and how high you stack your money. And true manhood is none of those things. Manhood is not from the waist down. It's from the neck up. That's what manhood is. And if we haven't been taught that, then no wonder we don't know how to look for that. So I was thinking, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe the issue is, and I was formulating my points, and I said, okay, God, maybe we should talk about what is the condition of your mouth. And the Holy Spirit checked me really quick. He said, no, that's not it. It's not what is the condition of your mouth. It's what is the condition of your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, yeah, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's not about what is the condition of your mouth. It's about what is the condition of your heart. Because if Jesus doesn't have your heart, it will never manifest in your mouth. Okay? So th this, this, this last part right here, I believe, applies to everybody. Okay? I want you to see this really quickly. Got these cups. Hopefully I don't make a mess up here. Um, so I believe there, there are different types of hearts. All right? I'm going to put the broken heart right here because the broken heart's kind of busted. Broken hearts have walls around them, right? So then we have an empty heart. Then we have a thirsty heart. And then we got a polluted heart, all right? So, yeah, let's do it like this. 
I believe we have different types of hearts. We have polluted hearts. We have thirsty hearts. We have empty hearts. We have broken hearts. And the ultimate goal of God, he wants us to have a whole heart. Okay? So let's talk about the polluted heart, right? Polluted hearts are people who have hazardous mouths. Okay? Their heart is polluted due to the secondhand smoke of something. God, this is good. Their heart is polluted due to the secondhand smoke of the childhood, due to the secondhand smoke of that ex, due to the secondhand smoke of a bad preacher, due to the secondhand smoke of being abused. And so now they'll curse you out because they mi- listen to music that curses them out. How in the world are you wondering, like, how do I stop cussing, but you're getting cussed out and you're paying $9.99 for it every day? You're paying an Apple subscription every single month, and you're wondering why. Why can't I stop cursing, but you're listening to things that keep cursing you out? Polluted. Polluted heart. And sometimes this heart is polluted because of pain. I've experienced pain because the devil knows unaddressed pain becomes your personality. So if I could, right, I wish I had like some ink or something. This polluted heart right here, many times is black with what they went through. The pain of what they went through. And so when you enter into this type of relationship, you're not going to get them to speak a whole language to you because they have a polluted heart. Somebody say polluted. And I've noticed, I don't know if you guys have been watching the news, pollution levels have dropped since this quarantine. (laughs) Pollution levels have dropped because sometimes staying in benefits atmospheres. Oh, Lord. Staying in prayer benefits the atmosphere of your heart. Staying in the word of God benefits the atmosphere of your character. Staying in community benefits the atmosphere atmosphere of your integrity maybe you're so polluted because you kept on getting outside of the will and God said right now in this season I need you to stay in my presence I need you to stay in my face not not as though you didn't do it before but we need to do this in overload right now because we have to address this polluted heart the second type of heart this is the thirsty heart okay people who have thirsty hearts they keep ending up in relationships where they're required to pour and other people drink They just want attention. They just want affection. They just want somebody to love them. They just want somebody to see their significance. They just want somebody to be there. I just want somebody to see my side. I just want to feel significant. So since they're so thirsty for that, they keep on getting in relationships. And most of the time when they get relationships, they keep doing this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Nah, you tripping. You just being sensitive. I appreciate that. Can I have your keys to your car? Can I have your keys to your place? Appreciate that. And they're left empty. They're left empty. So now what happens is this person who is thirsty, now they're empty. They have an empty heart. These are the type of people who just talk cold. No passion, no love. And you're like, man, why are they so heartless? It's because they're truly heartless. And the reason they're empty is because they poured out for so many people. They poured out for the parents. They poured out for the brothers. They poured out for the job. But nobody ever poured back into them. And since nobody ever poured back into them, they have an empty cup. And so they have an empty heart. And how that happens many times is every time you begin to express yourself to them, they don't really have much emotion. They don't really have many things to say. Because they have an empty heart, right? And now this one, this is the broken heart. You guys can see this in this little container. This is the broken heart. Now, this is the crazy thing about broken hearts. Broken hearts want people to treat them with love, but they're constantly surrounded with this wall, right? And these people be like, I know I got a wall around my heart. The dangerous thing with walls is nobody can get in and you can't get out, right? And so it don't matter. It doesn't matter how much people pour into you because every time somebody pours into you, there's all this brokenness, there's all these issues, and you're like, man, I didn't mean it like that. Why are you taking it like that? Every single thing you try to put into them, the love that you try to put in them, the compliments that you try to give them, the encouragement you try to give them, they never really receive it. Why? Because they're broken. They're broken. And listen, people who have a broken heart will break your heart. They speak the language of brokenness. They'll try to break you because they're dealing with brokenness themselves. Please listen. 
A whole glass can quench your, can quench your thirst, but that same glass, if broken, can cut you. And this is how a lot of people, this is what we do in our relationships. We bleed on people. We bleed on them. Every single person we go to, we constantly keep bleeding on them. It's not them. It don't even matter that they're polluted. It don't even matter that this person is thirsty. You're broken. So you constantly keep on bleeding on people who never cut you. And the last type of heart that God wants us to have is that whole heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. He wants our heart to be whole where people can pour into us and he can pour into us. And guess what? I can pour into you. I can pour into you. I can pour into you because I have a whole heart. And I think many times what we don't recognize is God wants you whole. He wants you whole because there's a whole lot of work that he needs for you to do. But I can't have you do the kingdom work. If you're so broken and you think everybody's going to take advantage of you and you have these constant trust issues and you don't know if their motive is sincere, I'm not saying don't have discernment. But I am saying we should trust God enough that God will show us people who are toxic. God will show us people that are trying to use us. God wants us to be whole. And I think many times for us to get here, we have to understand there's a language. So, Father God, we pray. Give us hearts, oh God. This, this is not really just about relationships. This is just in general. You told us in your word, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Rather, if we have a pollution flow, a thirsty flow, an empty flow, or a broken flow, God, give us the wisdom on how to guard our hearts, not wall our hearts, so that we can speak the language that you need us to speak, so that we can speak the language of grace. You told us to trust you. You told us to be patient. Now, God, you're challenging us to talk kingdom. And we pray that you'll touch our hearts and our minds so that the mind that was in Christ Jesus can also be on the inside of us. Give us whole hearts because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. And if we're constantly supposed to speak life in the people, I gotta be whole in my heart. You said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Make our hearts pure so that others can see you in us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not about the condition of your mouth. It's about the condition of your heart. God wants us to have pure hearts. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I pray that this message blessed you and challenged you. And also for us to understand, this was not just like a relational message, but it's more about the heart type that God needs. Because if Jesus doesn't have our heart, it will never reflect in our mouth. Make sure to join us on Sunday night at 6 p.m. Central Time for part four of this Try Me series. I'm so thankful for all of your love, all of your support, all of your prayers. We are honored to serve you. Can't wait to see you on Sunday night. Try me. Have a wonderful night.